Hugh Vail, and I think Hugh is here, watching out for her, yes. Gail is from Nebraska. She says she comes from the place where Johnny Carson came from. She has lived in Kansas, and they spent 20 years in Atlanta. She worked for IBM as a resource, human resources manager, which is a long way from art. She has been painting since she was a child, she says. She paints in um, oil and acrylic, watercolor, and in pen and ink. She does it all. <laughs> she is very prolific, and she does lots of things around the lake and is very involved in our church and our congregation and all of the activities that we do. She has three boys and four granddaughters, and which uh, <laughs> she is very interested in and goes out and plays with these girls. Uh, quite a bit. So it is good to have Gail with us tonight. Uh, she probably needs no introduction to you, but we will do this and turn off all of your uh, machines. <laughs> and I will turn it over to Gail. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Becky. I Personally, I'm very, very excited about this series, and I appreciate the fact that Becky came up with it so creatively, and everything that Gary is doing for the church services as well. It was their idea to do uh, art and spirituality, and this couldn't be a much more fascinating time than what we're going to talk about. Leonardo da Vinci, well, one of the first things I wanted to ask, um, can you hear me okay? Sometimes you might wonder, well, why did all the artists back in this era paint about the Bible? Well, for one thing, people couldn't read and write back during that time. Movable type was just becoming um, invented during the fifth, early 15th century, so there weren't any books. And most of the, the church used art to convey their message. And most of the artists that were famous at that time were really funded by uh, either political leaders or the church. In many cases, they were one and the same. Leonardo da Vinci is a, <clears throat> just gonna walk around with this. Leonardo da Vinci has a very interesting history. First of all, he was born to a peasant woman. He was an illegitimate child. His father was Sir, S-E-R, Piero of Vinci. They didn't go by last names, they went by first names, and Vinci was the town close to where uh, they lived. The, his father did not marry the peasant woman. The peasant woman raised da Vinci until he was about five, and she had no other children of her own, so she doted on him. She eventually got married, and his father got married. His, he first married a 16-year-old woman, and da Vinci went to live with his father and the 16-year-old woman, and she loved da Vinci. She did not live a long life, however. His second wife was 20 years old. It wasn't until da Vinci was around uh, 14 to 16 years old that he married his third and then subsequently his fourth wife. He had 17 half-siblings. <laughs> He didn't get, have very much, uh, he had very little formal education. He did learn reading, writing, and math, but he didn't learn um, science and etc. I mean, the other subjects, he kind of was self-taught on those. <coughs> At the age of 15, 14, 15, his father recognized that he had a great deal of artistic talent. And he apprenticed him out to Veraccio, who at that time, in Florence, was the leading artist, and Veraccio was ex excellent in painting and sculpture and goldsmithing. And so Leonardo da Vinci learned a great deal from him, and Veraccio actually focused a great deal on having uh, portraits anatomically correct, and that kind of started the seed in da Vinci's mind. Da Vinci was what they call a Renaissance man, and that's like the Renaissance man knows so much about so many things, and he was really, truly considered a genius. For a man to come from such humble beginnings and be as brilliant as he was, he really only has about 
15 paintings that survive to this day because he was so busy inventing his, his whole life. I'm going to point out a couple of things. This is the Vitruvian Man, and you've seen it copied on coins and t-shirts and, and all sorts of things throughout the world. It's, it's a pretty known image. That was his first study of the human body and getting the proportions correct. If we go into uh, flying machines, he did not invent the anometer. He did improve it, though, and that is a little device that tests wind speed. He, he used to buy birds in the market, and he'd buy them in cages, and he'd let them go. And the reason he did that is he wanted to watch them fly. He studied birds incessantly to understand how the aerodynamics worked. And he came up with the first prototype for an airplane. It was about a 33-foot wingspan. And the way it was developed, it would require a man to be laying down in the body of the plane and uh, using um, pulleys and et cetera to make it fly. Well, it never really, excuse the pun, got off the ground. Um, he, he came to the conclusion at one point that um, a man wouldn't have enough physical power to make it work. But he had all the plans to make it happen. The helicopter, he invented the aerial screw. And eventually, in I think it was 2000, I don't remember which one I'm thinking of, 2002, that his plans were used for some of the inventions that came about. The reason they weren't developed and tested before that is that his papers weren't published. And actually, when he died, they went to his companion who passed them on to his son. He had 13,000 pages of notes, and only about 7,000 exist today. The rest of them are lost. So if you're traveling in Europe, look under every rock. <laughs> there are about eight pages of his notes in some of his notebooks that are the only ones in private um, ownership today, and they're owned by Bill Gates. Bill Gates does loan them out once a year, and they, they go around to different countries to be on display. Bill Gates paid almost $31 million for them, just to give you an idea. So I wanted to go on a little bit. The parachute, actually, um, Da Vinci's design for a parachute was a triangle-shaped parachute. And his design was tested in later years and found to be superior to the one that we now know to be active today. Getting into war machines, first of all, he was a pacifist. He didn't um, believe in war, but his benefactors were military leaders. And so he couldn't understand, he, he, he would spend his time you know, just thinking about how to improve things and invent things. So he came up with a 33-barrel organ, which isn't a playing organ, it's, it's more like a cannon. It was three rows of 11 barrels. And the reason he wanted to improve that is because the, the cannon took so long to load and was so slow and so hard to move. And eventually, he came down with the triple barrel cannon that's down a little bit further for that reason, because it was much easier to move. And he could help his benefactors. I mean, there were wars going on all the time over there, between France and Italy in particular. So whoever he was trying to help, he wanted them to be a little bit more nimble on their feet. The armored car actually was a pretty interesting invention that he had. Um, it was a predecessor of today's armored car. And he wisely thought, well, you can't put horses in there to run it because you know they'd get scared and, and, it was, and they were too big. So he had men pulling pulleys in there to turn it around. The giant crossbow was a pretty advanced um, description on his part. And, and all of his notes, he kept detailed notes and detailed drawings. If we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words, his ability to draw helped his invention so much and helped men be able to understand it. And we know in today's world that there are certain professions where being able to draw is very handy, right? <laughs> Um, as far as the clock, he didn't invent the clock. 
He approved it, though. The original clock was based upon pulleys. He came up with a spring system that allowed clocks to keep time on hours and minutes separately. So it was a huge improvement. Um, Colossus, I have to talk about. Colossus, and I'm thinking of Stephanie when I talk about this, because we had a we had a discussion about Michelangelo and Da Vinci, and they were very competitive with each other, even though um, Da Vinci was about 20 before Michelangelo was even born. But Michelangelo heard about Da Vinci from the time he was a baby. It's like, okay, who is this guy, you know? So there was a lot of competition between them. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about Michelangelo because I know Ked is going to, but I wanted to mention Colossus. It was a 24 foot bronze horse statue commissioned by the Duke of Milan. And he did build this huge horse out of clay. But in order to bronze it, it was going to take 80 tons of bronze. So he had to build it in such a way that the bronze could be evenly applied, otherwise the horse would collapse. So he invented a new molding technique, and then he invented an oven to heat the bronze. But before he could do it, another war caused them to, to give the bronze to another country. So he didn't have the bronze, so he couldn't uh, mold it. And then eventually, an invading army used it for target practice. So I just want to mention, he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty on that, but um, he did leave so many projects undone because he was such a thinker and such a visionary that he couldn't keep his focus in some cases. And then in others, he kept getting traded off or moving off to some other benefactor. Uh, one of the first paintings that I will show you is, is one of those cases. He invented the ideal city, or at least the plans for it. It was a series of connected canals and sewers, and, and sewers were important back then because the lack of sewers really contributed to all of the disease and plagues and causing people to die. His idea was that on the upper tier of the city would be all of the uh, refined people and the lower tier underneath would be where all the merchants were. His plan was a great plan, but it was so big, nobody ever built it. Nobody had the money to build it. I came up with a robotic knight, a self-propelled car. Scuba, scuba gear is an interesting one. For the city of Venice, when they were at war, he invented scuba gear, gear that would allow soldiers to be underwater it was made out of leather, and it had a, a reed kind of a, a pipe that took it up to the top, and like kind of like the old uh, cane pole fishing with the bobbin. You know, you got a bobbin. They were made out of cork, and that's what kept it up on the top. A um, couple other things. The revolving bridge he designed for the Duke, Duke Sforza, who was in Florence, to help them navigate difficult-to-travel areas because you know, they'd come across terrain that they weren't familiar with. And so if they had a, a revolving bridge, they could lower the sides and get across and move on. And Elaine just told me an interesting thing that he invented that I didn't know about. She found out at Trivia the other night. He invented the scissors. And we won. He invented so many things that I haven't even touched on. He invented musical instruments, the viola. Um, he built stables. He built um, floats for parades. He did a lot of um, building things for uh, his benefactors whenever they needed them for entertaining or whatever they were going to do. I mentioned his notes, the 7,000 pages that we know of, besides the ones that Bill Gates owns. The rest are, some of them published, many of them are in books in uh, the Royal Library in, Mid in Windsor, in the Louvre, in London, Milan. Um, they're, they're kind of scattered all over the place. Thank God we have them. This is the earliest known drawing that he did in 1473 of the Arno Valley. Now, this looks like kind of a mundane thing. The reason I even included this is because at that time, nobody had maps. And in fact, uh, when he was 50 years old, he, he, he was in the service of Cesar Borgia, who was the son of Pope Alexander VI. I'll have to ask you about that later. But um, 
he was a military architect and engineer, and he created a map of Imola, which was the stronghold for Cesar. The map was of such value to Cesar that he immediately made Da Vinci his chief architect, chief engineer, and chief military advisor. I'm going to show you a couple of the drawings. This is an example of the detail of the drawings that Da Vinci recorded that we know about. And I'm so, if, if I'm in somebody's way, give me a high sign. I'm trying to stay away from the screen. One of the things you'll note in the drawings is that he understood perspective. Perspective is really, this part is closer to you than, than that part, and so the lines are longer when they're closer to you and shorter when they're further away from you. He personally didn't invent it, but he did a lot to bring it along in his paintings. This is another one just to show, you know, his thinking and the perspective. And this one, his extensive work on the human body. He was allowed by one of the hospitals to dissect bodies. And he dissected bodies and really studied how everything worked. He didn't really focus so much on getting the image of anything. It was how everything worked. It was how plants grew. It was how birds flew. It was how the human body worked. It was how muscles, I mean, he went clear down into lower layers to see the sinews, the ten, you know, the tendons and etc. And one of the things that he, um, it was Pope Leo, I believe, that um, eventually forbid him from dissecting bodies because they thought he was getting a little too off center on some of the things that he was doing. I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, about the beliefs of the church. He, he took a lot of his notes backwards. He wrote backwards. And I know some of you are familiar with that, If you're, particularly if you're teaching in uh, the Greensboro Elementary School. And I know Lois and I both have teaching the students. And it's fun to try and write something backwards and then give them a mirror. It's very difficult to write backwards. And there are different theories on why he did it. One theory is that people thought he was a heretic. Uh, he was afraid of the church. Um, but really, the prevailing theory is that he's left-handed and he just thought it was easier because he was going from left to, or right to left. One of the, another thing about uh, human bodies that I thought was really interesting, he, he was so interested in how um, human emotions worked. If he saw a face that he thought was interesting, he'd follow that person around all day long and draw sketches of him. <laughs> he, he, he really was um, particularly enamored with rage and how it affected people and what caused it. And so if you, I mean, I, I didn't put that many sketches up here, but um, there were some interesting sketches of some of the more grotesque faces and the expressions, and he used that in his painting. And really, he did influence Michelangelo from that standpoint because of uh, the power and the um, motion that he included in his paintings. And he did some sculptures, but not many. This is a baby in utero, which is hard to believe that in the late 1400s, someone really understood it well enough to document that. The first painting that I wanted to talk about is um, Baptism of Christ. Now his teacher, Veraccio, originally painted this, but Veraccio got to a point in his career where his students pretty much finished his paintings. In this one, Da Vinci painted the angels over here. And he did such a fabulous job. And one of the reasons was that he started using oil paint. It, it was really introduced up from Greece. And uh, the artist just started to use oil. And I'm going to talk about mediums in a minute, too. 
Most of this painting was done in tempera, egg tempera. Egg tempera was the paint of the day at that time, and egg tempera is made from ground up pigment, egg yolks, and maybe a tiny bit of water. And I brought an example that I'll leave up here later of an egg tempera painting. This one happens to be by Pete Muzika, who lives close to Madison. He's the only one I know that still paints in it. I find it to be too much of a pain to mix the paints and do it. And you have to have a special ground to paint it on, or, or it doesn't work either. He does beautiful work, though. And he told me, he found out something recently, that um, he's always concerned about keeping the egg yolks fresh. And he'll use a little bit of it, and then he'll put it back on ice. And he just found out recently that if you had a couple of drops of vodka, it'll last for days. <laughs> and I said, that's encouraging for me. <laughs> So what the painters did back in that time was to, they painted uh, frescoes. And what fresco means is that they would paint with egg tempera into wet plaster. And if they painted into wet plaster, it would become a part of it and it would dry. And, it, and one of the reasons Pete says he likes to use egg tempera is because it's so thin to put on, it's very thin layers. And there are others of us who like to put on, gop it on, you know, with oil paint or acrylic and make them real thick layers. But um, egg tempera has a different look about it, and a lot of artists like to use it. And that time, because oil was so new, they weren't really that familiar with it. Well, when da Vinci painted the angels, you could blend a lot more with oil paint than you can with either acrylic or with uh, egg tempera. And he, he got such, such a rosy face, particularly this angel right here. He developed a technique that people used to call it um, forma, fumato. It's Leonardo's smoke. That's what it translates to. It's the shadowy, the blending that causes it to be that way. I'm going to give you a little bit closer up picture of this just so you can see the angel. Now I have to tell you, um, Veraccio was so totally impressed with Da Vinci's painting of this, and Da Vinci also did paint a little bit more of that painting as well. Uh, there are, there's evidence that he, did a, he went over a lot of it with oil paint after the fact. But Veraccio was so enamored with Da Vinci's ability that he never painted after that. And I mean, he was still a sculptor and a goldsmith, so he spent a lot of time sculpting and you know doing his goldsmith work. I have to bring you. I have to show you another little picture. Judy's granddaughter, who is a freshman over at UGA in art, did the colored pencil drawing of a bee and showed her teacher, and her teacher said, okay, now you teach the class. <laughs> so I'll leave it up here for you to see that later too. Anyway, I want to go back to um, look at the top where you see God's hands welcoming and the dove, and this is um, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. This angel is holding Jesus' is clothes. It's, it's just a wonderful first work of da Vinci's. This was his actual first commission. And not too surprisingly, it's not finished. He was pulled away to another um, area before it was finished. But one of the things I wanted to point out about this, the Adoration of the Magi, is the way he com composed it. You know, the, with um, the Virgin Mary and the baby right in the middle, and you see all the scenery in the back with the um, perspective and all the people. That wasn't real common back then. He, he came up with different compositions that were unusual for the current way of thinking. Fumato. This was commissioned for the monks of San Donato in Florence. He went over to, the reason he didn't finish it, he went over to Milan to uh, work for the ruling clan, which was Forza at that time. 
The next one I'm not going to uh, go into any <laughs> theories. <laughs> I mean, there's been enough debate about uh, the Last Supper and the Lord's Supper, so I want to make a couple of points about this one, and one of them is the composition. The key thing being the ceiling, the perspective, and again the composition where Jesus is in the center, and then the disciples are all in groups of threes. They have, they're very expressive faces, and one of the reasons is because of all the research and the study that he did on expressions. This was commissioned by the Monastery of Santa Maria del Gracia in Milan for their dining hall. And it was painted around 1495, so he would have been about uh, 40 years old. Now within five years, well first of all, he didn't paint on wet plaster, he did paint on plaster. He didn't paint with egg tempera, he used oil paint. Within five years it started to flake. And it's been restored at least six times with uh, some, a lot of debate about the quality of the restoration. The first restoration was about a hundred years after it was first painted and uh, the town people were so irate because the, the, whoever was doing the restoration had repainted all the disciples' faces except three. And then subsequently in later times, during the Napoleon Wars, there were food fights in the dining hall. And so, I mean, this, this poor painting took a lot of abuse. <laughs> Here's another version of it. I mean, see how different it is. Yes, Matthew holding the money. Um, I'm not going into any of the Da Vinci codes, so just know that. <laughs> I was asked by a good friend yesterday, was Leonardo a Christian? And I didn't know the answer to that. I assumed he was because he interpreted, he gave his own interpretation to every painting that he did, and every symbol in the paintings meant something. He put them in for a reason. He didn't just idly put anything in there. And uh, it kind of reminds me, you know, the Clinton portrait. You've read about that recently. <laughs> I mean, then they, now it's in storage, of course, but, uh, the, but the artist who painted it put this little shadow that he said was reminiscent of the blue dress, and he said in his defense he's, he is documenting history. Anyway, <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci was baptized as a newborn. His grandfather actually documented the baptism, which is one of the reasons that we all know when he was born. He, because he had such an inquiring mind, and he was such a broad thinker, he based his beliefs on reason. And the church at the time at least, based everything on faith. And reason and faith were sort of in conflict. Um, he, had, he did believe that God exists. He was a liberal Christian, perhaps. We don't really know that one way or the other. But from documentation, he, he, it would be hard to believe he would be a devout Roman Catholic because of the fact that he was a truth seeker. And the Roman Catholics imprisoned truth seekers at that time. You know, and Pope Leo X, they said, stopped him from dissecting bodies. He also thought that the Roman Catholic Church scammed the less fortunate because they were selling relics and the obligatory confessions and, and miracles from priests who were living instead of saints, etc. And, and he also felt that the Roman Catholic Church had a very literal translation of the Old Testament. It's hard to believe, it's hard to understand, but you know, he used the knowledge that he had to paint very interpretive pieces. Um, I found a reference in Joshua the other, what, yesterday actually. I find this sort of significant, so. In Joshua, 10 verses 12 through